Welcome to the latest edition of Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime with me, Marsh and Kenny. Well, you're going to love today's interview. It comes with one of the most inspirational and motivational people in the entire basketball world. That's right. Today's interview is going to come with head Southern Miss women's basketball coach, Joy Lee McNillis. Well, as you know, I love the fan comments and fan interaction for this show. And I'm going to bring you some of those in this next segment that we call Four and Out. Well, recently on Twitter and Facebook, I asked the Southern Miss Nation, what do you do in the offseason now that Southern Miss baseball is over? I mean, it's over two months until football kicks off, so I'd like to hear what you do. I mean, sometimes I'm trying to figure out what to do in those summer months until that football season kicks off. So I can only pick four comments, but there were a lot of good ones. So here we go. And first up, one of the fan favorites from Southern Miss World, Cloverleaf Mall from Twitter said, Reintroduce myself to my family, get a haircut, hashtag SMTTT, good stuff right there. Next up, James Trussell from Facebook said, it is never off my mind. It is like sawdust in the circus. It is my blood. I play reruns of Southern Miss sports. Love what you do. Hope to see you soon, SMTTT. Thanks, James, and great comments right there. Next up, at Baseball and Democracy Rock from Twitter said, Usually, I give myself about a week to shift gears to Major League Baseball. Unfortunately, I'm a Cardinals fan, so this year I pretty much have nowhere to go until football season. Oh, and Southern Miss Baseball fall ball. Yeah, let's not forget about that as well. Good stuff right there. Baseball and democracy rock. And finally, Matt Hopkins from Facebook said, Keep my mind off USM sports? It's hard to do. I just got done scrolling through the baseball Twitter page watching those highlight clips. Good stuff right there. Appreciate all the fan comments and please keep sending them in. Well, once again, the next part of this show is an interview that's going to motivate and inspire you. It, it, it's a lady that Southern Miss thinks the world of and the college basketball world thinks the world of. So today's interview comes with the one and only Southern Miss head women's basketball coach, Joy Lee McNellis. Well, you won't find a more motivational, more inspirational, and better leader of young women than my interview today. That's right. It's head Southern Miss women's basketball coach, Coach Joy Lee McNellis. And Coach, it is an absolute honor to have you on. How's the world treating you, Coach? You know, it's been really good. Uh, we just finished up with our June camps, and so that was really good. We started on June the 5th. And we finished on June the 12th. So we went basically seven days straight, starting out with four-year-olds and up the first camp. And I will tell you, those little ones had a blast. Uh, I will tell you, we did a closing ceremony with them from four-year-olds to nine-year-olds, and it lasted about 15 minutes. And the little ones through nine-year-olds, but especially those younger ones, they kept the ball on their hip when they were supposed to. They handled all the ball handling drills. Some of the parents said, how did you get them to be still for that long? They were amazing, but our players were absolutely amazing with those youngers. We had 73, so it was awesome. And uh, it, I love camp. You know, I love basketball camp. I grew up getting to go to some camps. And so I'm real motivated when it comes to camp. I want to make sure the children have a great time, but it is also important to me that they learn because my parents made a sacrifice for me to be able to go to camp. And so I tell players when they want to lag during camps, your parents made a sacrifice. They did not come up with money for you to be lazy. So we're not going to be lazy at all. But I do. I love it. And things are going great. Now it's time for recruiting. Coach, I know they're only four years old, but did you see any future Joy Lee McNillises, any future Janice <laughs> Felders, any, any future Dominique Davises? Did you see some? I know they're four. But not, just maybe... not at four, but I okay. will tell you, we did have elite camp that was our last camp. And we did see some future stars. Actually, you know, some people talk about elite camp and, you know, everybody thinks they're an elite player. Uh, unfortunately, they're not there yet. So that's why we run a position camp. And so when we run that position camp, that prepares them for elite camp. But we had an elite camp and we had 50-something players in it. 
And it was really good players in it. And actually, we made two offers out of that camp to juniors that were here. Uh, we had some 27s in the state of Mississippi, some 26s in the state of Mississippi that were very, very good. But both players that we made offers to, one's out of Mountain Home, Arkansas, other one's out of uh, Houston, Texas, and we had never seen them play before, ever. And so I tell recruits all the time and young players in general, go to camps where you think you have an opportunity to play. Showcase your skills when you're ready to showcase them. You don't want to go to someone's elite camp when you're not ready because then you're going to be taken off the list and they're never going to look at you again. You've got to be ready to showcase your skills. And we had several in our camp that we already had offered and they moved up the ladder. But we had two young ladies that we had never seen. Someone called in and recommended them. And we were like, whoa, because, you know, you've been around the game. Everybody thinks their niece or their cousin can play. And so that's not always the case. But this time, it was the case. And uh, if anybody doesn't know, Coach McNeil has had one heck of a career at Southern Miss. She still leads Southern Miss top 10 in, in seven statistical categories to this day. She was voted into the Southern Miss Hall of Fame. And, and, and Coach, when you got inducted to the Hall of Fame, how did it make you feel? You know, it was truly an honor because, you know, I never really thought about it, to be truthful. Uh, didn't even really know there was a, such a thing as a Hall of Fame, to be very honest with you. And I was coaching at Memphis at the time when I got the call. And uh, I was like, me? For real? Um, and so I was uh, very humbled and very blessed uh, to even be able to share it with my high school buddy, even though he was in middle school, Brett Favre. We were able to share that stage together of being inducted into the Hall of Fame together. Oh, that's awesome. And well-deserved. Anybody knows your career and everything you've done around Southern Miss. And uh, before we kind of get you know, some of your backstory and really get into Southern Miss women's basketball, everybody that knows you, you, you're such a great motivator. And you got this phrase, I'm fired up. Yeah. Coach, what is that? You know, I've said it, but it means something to you, Coach. What does that mean, I'm fired up, when, when you say that? <laughs> you know, I, I do. I use that often. And my players laugh at me all the time because I'm fired up. Coach is fired up. You know, my belief is if you're not passionate about what you're doing, why do it? And Marchant, at 15 years old, my dream was to play college basketball at Southern Miss. And at 61, I'm still living my dream. And so God has put me in a position to be able to continue to live my dream. And it is my responsibility to do my very best to help share my dream with other people and do my very best to impact their lives so they can live their own personal dream. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, we'll, we'll get to why you're such a motivator and great leader and just inspirational. So many people. And uh, but let's get into those Hancock High School days, Coach. You had a heck of a career there. Two state titles and you're still the school's all-time leading scorer. Give, give me some high school stories, Coach, from Hancock. You no, know, this is the one thing I wish. I wish they had the three-point line back in then, but they didn't. <laughs> and, uh, you know, playing at Hancock, I graduated with 113. And so it was K through 12 all on the same campus. So you knew everybody. So when I was in elementary school, school, the great Wendell Ladner, the great Berlin Ladner that played here at Southern Miss, I grew up watching them play. And my dad always talked the game to us, always talked the game. And so I can remember very vividly watching those greats play. And so honestly, when Wendell and Berlin came to Southern Miss back many, many, many years before I ever played here, you know, they paved the way for people in Hancock County. They led, took the torch from Hancock County to come to Southern Miss. And so, so many of us wanted to follow their footsteps. And, you know, back then as a young girl, there was not TV for women's basketball. So all you saw back then were guys on TV. 
And so being from that same area, you followed them. You know, you, I mean, I can remember Memphis, uh, the Memphis Showboats when Wendell played there, uh, following his career when he got killed in Eastern Airlines. You know, all of us little kids was at his funeral. When Dr. J, when they all showed up the night of his wake, all of us little kids, we were there when that limousine, we had never seen a limousine. I don't know if a limousine had ever been in Hancock County. And we were there at that limousine and Dr. J got out and it seemed like he was two feet taller than anyone else there. And uh, we all, all the kids got to hold his shoe. That was a big deal that night. And uh, so we grew up knowing the importance of basketball, knowing the importance of living a dream. And my parents really instilled that in me. I'll tell you this, Marchant. My dad, we had a rule in our house. I never had to wash dishes after we ate at night as long as I was shooting basketball. And I had lights on my court. My court was in a pecan orchard. And I had lights streamed from tree to tree. And so my court originally was in a field. And it had cow manure on it. And we shoveled it before we played. And so I thought my dad would drop a box blade and scrape the grass off. And he said, sis, no, you and your brothers have to bounce it every morning to get all the grass off. So every morning before I caught a school bus, I bounced that ball on that damp grass to break down that grass. And I made 150 shots every morning before I got on the school bus. And that was in elementary school. And our court was dirt for years after we all left home. And uh, actually, two weeks ago, I was at my parents and I was in a shed, old shed that my dad had. And I found our first rim. We played in the state tournament all four years in high school. I was moved up as a ninth grader was able to start as a ninth grader. We lost in the first round of the state championship. My sophomore year was the heartbreaking year. We played in the state championship game and my players, I tell them this every year. We got beat in the state championship game on a buzzer beater because we did not block out on the free throw line. Mm -hmm. And then we won the next two years and I had great teammates. You know, I had another teammate that played here at Southern Miss. Um, she stayed maybe a couple of weeks and she couldn't handle being away from Hancock County and she went back home. Um, but we had some really, really good players. All of the group that played with me signed junior college and then the two of us came here and then she headed back home for a while. Mm -hmm. Coach, I mean, what an incredible story. We're just starting this interview and I got Dr. J pulling up in a limo. I got you <laughs> instead of cutting grass with a mower, doing it with a basketball. I got buzzer beaters. Geez, we're just starting to, man. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Coach, I do want to get into something before even Southern Miss talk, your, your playing days there. Some of the challenges of being a female athlete, trying to get recognized uh, back then and really making a name for yourself. You mentioned not as much TV. Right. It, it was not. And so there were, honestly, uh, we didn't have social media. We didn't have any of that. And so professional basketball my last year in college, which was 83, 84, they began to have a pro league, but it was very limited. The Rita, Rita Easterlin that played at Mississippi College, Lusa Harris that played at Delta State back then, they were all older than me, but they had been picked up by different pro leagues. Uh, Rita Easterlin played for the Chicago Hustle back then. And this is what her payment was for getting MVP. She got a recliner. I can remember that. She got a recliner for being oh, the MVP. Uh, I don't remember where Lucy Harris played, but it wasn't like there was Europe leagues or anything like that. Um, there was, I, I don't even remember another team except the Chicago Hustle because back then Rita, Rita Easterlin was really a star. Yes, Lucy Harris was a star as well, but Chicago Hustle being in a national media market they got a little more exposure, no TV or anything like that. Uh, but they went and got the older players, the players that were coming out the year I was coming out. You know, they didn't mess with us. 
So you didn't have those opportunities. I wish they did. I, I definitely would have been one that would have tried to get that opportunity. Um, but, you know, you didn't have, unless you knew them in your state, you didn't have female basketball players to look up to. Um, and so Coach James had only been here. She came in 78, 79. And so our program was relatively young, Delta State Mississippi College and the W, which is there in Columbus, the Mississippi University for Women. That was the three schools that had been in existence and given scholarships for women's basketball. Uh, but it was much more diff different then. You did not get exposure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and, but great take on, on just the challenges back then and really making a name for yourself. But, but like I said, you did make a huge name for yourself at Hancock Kai. Wound up going to Southern Miss from 80 to 84. Wound up scoring over 1,000 points in your career. You make the Hall of Fame. I mean, uh, and, and you did hit on one topic right there, head coach Kay James. I mean, she, she's just a legend, beloved figure in the Southern Miss world. Just your your time, coached by Kay, Kay James, and, and, and how your time was at Southern Miss. You know, I loved it. Uh, coach James was amazing, and she's still amazing. You know, I include her in everything we do. She does radio with Jason Baker. Uh, as soon as I came back to Southern Miss in 04, I reached out to Coach James, and I said, Coach, you've got to walk this journey with me. She said, I'm with you step by step. And so she has been, and I'm very grateful for her giving me the opportunity. And she was just um, an amazing lady. She was a great role model for us. Um, now, I will be honest with you, we didn't play much defense under her. She didn't believe a whole lot in defense. Uh, we believed in scoring the ball. And my junior year, we led the nation in scoring. We averaged 98 a game, and that was without the three-point line. My senior year, we scored over 111 times without the three-point line. <laughs> Our UAB score was 117 to 113. No three-point line. We shot it. We let them shoot it to get it back to go score. In the UAB game, I scored 39 and was not the leading scorer. And uh, so I played on a very, very good team. And Coach James gave us a lot of – we didn't run a lot of plays, I'll be honest with you. The point guard that we had at one time was Amy. She's Griffin now. Her name was Hyden. And then we had Diane Backstrom that was our point guard. They gave it up. Well, actually, in that game, the one um, 17 to 113, Amy set the assist record. She had 16 assists in that game. And, um, you know, we actually broke a lot of records in that game. But, I mean, if we would have had the three-point line, no telling how many points we would have scored. Oh, Coach, that, that's incredible. It, it run and gun, fun and gun type offenses like that, kind of – it really makes me truly believe that all that added to that aura that was going on in Hattiesburg, 80s Eagle Fever. Yeah, that's I mean, right. How is it being around that – I mean, you're adding to it. You know, oh, my goodness. It was awesome. Go <laughs> Talk, talk about 80s Eagle Fever because you can't put a you can put a thumb on it. It was just something going on. <laughs> yeah, you know, you had Reggie Collier, you had Sammy Winder, um, you had Floyd that was from Gulfport. That was, I think, he was a fullback playing the backfield. I don't know if he's running back, fullback, what he was. Um, but I mean, football was good. MK Turk had it going here with the men. You had the NIT. The championship that was at, right after that, I mean, it was amazing in the 80s here. And, um, you know, you had packed arenas. It was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, it's just, you know, that's what would be so awesome of what Scott Berry has built. And I really, really hate, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're going to lose him and he's retiring. But what a great way to go out. Holy smoke. And the impact that he's made. And, you know, the things that I've tweeted is we can't forget what his family has been through through all of this. You know, because it's not always been positive for him. You know, people have been negative. And that's what I posted yesterday. The thing is, is that your family suffers when it's negative. Probably more than the coach does. And the coach is going to move on. But the family holds on to that. And so I hope that people will remember to thank the family as well as Scott. 
And so during that time in Eagle Fever, I don't know if there was much negative at all, but everybody was winning. Everybody was winning. And so when you win, whoo, it's good. And am I wrong, Coach? Doesn't it feel like that's kind of coming back a little bit? I mean, y'all y'all tore it up on the hardwood this year, men's basketball, football. You know, It just feels that something's happening. I don't know. It is. It is. I do think that tide has turned, and I think we're only moving up. I think there's tremendous amount of energy <clears throat> all across our campus, uh, from the academic side to the athletic side. Uh, I think in having Joe Paul as our president, you know, he's an energizer bunny. You know, he could have been the mascot when he was here in school. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's energized. I think it's all through the entire university. And I think that's amazing. So Eagle Fever, I agree uh, that it's here. And so oh. every sport is enjoying success. It really is. It's a lot of fun being a Southern Miss fan right now. And, and let's get back to kind of the 80s real quick and just kind of detail with your career and an uh, unbelievable Hall of Fame career at Southern Miss. But, it, you know, you're just one of these motivational, inspirational, I'm fired up kind of people. So in 84, it makes sense. You're getting to coach in Texas State to Lady Six. So how, how was that little run coach and getting your career started? You know, I was very, again, God's really blessed me. He really has. Um, well, I... When I played here at Southern Miss, my husband was an assistant at Florida State. He was at Florida State. He was assistant at Florida State. He's got his career started at Clemson. Uh, Bill McClellan actually was his AD. And he was an assistant at Clemson. He was assistant at Florida State. And so, of course, it was back the old Metro my last two years in, in college. And so that's when we went NCAA. That's the first two years of the NCAA for women's basketball to join. And so he was in charge of their defense at Florida State. And he would say, well, somebody guard the white girl. And I would run by and I'd say, you don't have anybody to guard me. And he would say, shut up. And so I'd score again and he'd say, somebody stop the white kid. And I would run by and I'd say, you ain't got nobody to guard me. So that's kind of how he and that's I how. connected. And um, so I was going to get married my senior year in college to somebody else. That didn't work out. So he had gotten, after my junior year, he had gotten the job at Southwest Texas then. Now it's Texas State. And they were moving from D2 to D1. So he actually called Dr. Bud Ginn, that was then the vice president, and asked what I was doing. And I had then, that summer, I was started my MBA and uh, was going to go to grad school and be Coach James's grad assistant. And uh, so Dr. Ginn came and got me. I was in class, actually. And uh, he said, and that's how, how family Southern Miss is. So he, he knew where I was in class. So he came and got me out of class. And he said, you remember this guy, Dennis McNellis? And I said, yeah, he used to harass me. He said, well, he wants to talk to you about a job. But I told him you wouldn't be interested and you would never go that far from home. I said, well, Dr. Ginn, if he's going to pay money, I'm only getting 3000 to be a GA. So when I, he actually called me back then, landline, you know how that goes. And uh, I at the first question I asked him was, how much money will I make? And he said, 17000 I said, that's more than $3,000. i am interested. <laughs> and so I flew out with my parents to interview. Because my mom says, I remember that guy. I think he's hiring you to marry you. And we're going with you. We don't trust him. <laughs> well, little did we know, we got married four years after I worked for him. So I was with him for two years. And uh, when we got married four years later, I was back here at Southern Miss as an assistant. And then I spent my five years here. So that's kind of how all that came about. Coach, that love and basketball. And I've been married 35 years now. There you go. What an awesome marriage. Love and basketball. Putting it together. Right. I love that. Um, but yet, yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. Come back to Southern Miss and get a chance to be an assistant under your coach while you were playing. Kay James. How was that dynamic coming back to? to work with uh, Kay James as, as an assistant. 
it was great because, you know, I think we had such a great relationship as a player coach. She gave me a lot of freedom in recruiting. Coach James really didn't like to recruit. She didn't like to travel. And it was Shirley and I. And so Shirley and I did all the recruiting initially. And then it was Portland and I. And uh, let me tell you this. We were in an office about a 14 by 14 office in the Coliseum. Coach James had a desk. I had a desk. Shirley worked part-time in sports information, and then she came in. And then our grad assistant had a TV tray. She worked on a TV tray. That was her desk. We were all in the same office. And so that's when we got to the Coliseum. My first year, Helen Grant and I were in a trailer with Coach Jay Larry Ladner, Jay's dad, Dr. Slay, Dr. Mark Manival, and Coach Knight's mom. She was the secretary over there. And then Coach James was in the Coliseum with Coach Turk and all the athletic administrators, because all the athletic administrators used to be in the Coliseum. So we went from the trailer to four of us in the same room. So times have changed a little bit. Ooh, uh, strong bonds were built, though, coaching yeah, in those right. environments. I mean, all on top of each other trying to get this basketball game that's going. Right. But, but, I mean, y'all so did year, awesome. Year two, we signed a recruiting class that was ranked nationally, which included Janice Felder, Tanya Bullock, and that entire crew. And from that point, we took off. Oh, yeah, and then y'all went to three NCAA tournaments while you right. were there. But, right. but uh, Janice Felder, I mean, you know, I even got to know her when I started my career at Southern Miss when she was there. I mean, the most decorated basketball player in women's basketball, Southern Miss history. And uh, But your relationship with Janice early on right there, I mean, you recruited her. Yeah, and she, when I announced that I was going to Memphis, she said, Coach, I'm going with you. And I said, Janice, you can. She said, Coach. I came here because of you, because she was my baby. And I said, you can't, you have to stay here. So I left, went for my press conference. Well, she had her own press conference with WDAM. And she announced she was leaving Southern Miss and going to Memphis. So Bill McClellan called me with his cigar. Oh, we gotta get back down here. <laughs> We got to have a meeting. And I said, yes, sir, I'll come back. So I came back and we sat in Mr. Mack's office with Coach James and Janice was just a crying, holding my hand. And so I looked at her and I said, Janice, I recruited you to play for Coach James. She's a great lady. She's going to take care of you. You're going to have a great career here. You're going to put Southern Miss on the map. You're going to do things that's never been done here. You have to stay at Southern Miss. And so I'm so glad she did. So glad she did. Had an unbelievable career. And Janice and I are still, to this day, very close. Janice is battling breast cancer right now. And she came by and talked to our team. And uh, I've been her encourager as she's going through this breast cancer since I've battled cancer. Uh, but she's just an amazing, amazing, amazing person. Oh, yeah, Coach, and they're definitely getting to that story. I mean, just one of the reasons you're one of the most inspirational, motivational people you'll ever meet, people. I promise you that. And uh, you had a heck of a run right there at Memphis. I mean, as the head coach, I mean, four NCAA tournaments, four conference titles, you're the finalist for Coach of the Year. And uh, and you just meet and impact in so many people, you know, early on in your career. And, and, and Pat Summit in Tennessee. You really got to know her. I mean, you're at Memphis. She's at Tennessee. I mean, legendary basketball coach, just like yourself. And how was how was that uh, dynamic? Just being kind of close in the same state with Pat Summit. You know, Pat obviously is a legend, no doubt, across the board in ba women's basketball, but in basketball in general. The I think the coolest thing that Pat and I shared is we both had our first child very close together. And um, Tyler and Whitney were born just days separate of each other. So we shared mother stories. So we had a relationship other than basketball. And I think that was kind of cool because it was different than most people. 
Now she made a heck of a lot more money than me and she had a nanny and all that. I didn't have any of that. Uh, but it was an inspiring to me to be able to share stories and the challenges that you face being a mom and being in a career that's forever changing every single day. And so it was really good. One story I will tell you about Pat Summit, though, on the basketball side. We played at the Elmer Field House, which holds 2,800 people. I had a great, I, I had a lot of really good boosters at Memphis, but with so many corporations there, we had FedEx, uh, Dave Bronzak, you know, those guys were very helpful to me with my players and men's basketball, football. And then I had a gentleman named Frank Roberts, which was probably my go-to guy. Frank was the uh, CEO of the broadcast division of the New York Times. And Frank uh, was part owner in WREG, which is the one of the TV stations there. So we were play we moved the game from the pyramid to the Elmer Field House, which seated 2,800. So Frank came to me and he said, this is the deal, Joy. I'm buying all the tickets. Tennessee will not be able to get in here. And I said, well, Frank, I don't think we should do that. <laughs> we need to at least give them 100. He said, okay, I'll buy 2,700 tickets. We'll give them to our season ticket holders. They can get theirs. But the rest, I'm buying them. We're not going to have a sea of orange in here. So he did. And we gave them to all Memphis people. So they scalped $7 tickets outside our arena for $50 each. Mm. And it was just a great environment. Our football team then, which Rip Shear was the head football coach then. And we had a stage back then in the field house. And we put bleachers up there in Rip's football team set in the stands. So when Tennessee first walked in for warmups, they started harassing them. It was the coolest atmosphere. <laughs> so after the game, when Pat shook my hand, we played unbelievable. It was like a four to six point game with five minutes to play. I really thought we were going to win. They were mm -hmm. ranked number one in the country. We played amazing. Mm -hmm. Um in any, but you know, they blew us out right there at the very end. But when she shook my hand at the end, she said, My brother is a state senator and he could not get in this game. He said, I will never play you again if we have to play in this arena. <laughs> and I said, Well, coach, we have a four year contract. She said, I will never play you in this arena. We played in the pyramid from that point on. So, well, well, damn, uh, that's awesome. Like, y'all are strong arm in the legendary Pat Summit. I love it, coach. You know, and then learn about your basketball play, a little smack talker, and you strong arm <laughs> in Pat Summit. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> But, and coach, getting your coaching career, I'm, you know, studying about you, learning about you, so awesome. I mean, um, you said coaching is kind of a, a calling from God in a way. Yes. I mean, it, it means more than X's and O's. And uh, kind of before we get into kind of Southern Miss stuff with your head coaching career there, I mean, talk about what, what coaching means to you and, and making an impact on, on young women. You know, I do believe that coaching is a calling. I, I Just like the ministry is a calling. I just believe coaching is a calling. And I do believe it's a part of ministry because we're put in a place to make a difference in people's lives. Obviously, the lives of our team, the lives of our coaching staff, and the lives of the people that surround us. I really believe that. I believe that God puts us in this position to be able to influence people in a positive way. I also believe and, you know, I think it talks about it in the book of Job and in the book of Solomon, how you have to lead people. And I think you lead them in a way to help them have success. Now, not everyone understands that. And not everyone is going to agree with how you lead them. And you are going to make leaders. You are going to make mistakes as leaders. I've made lots of mistakes as a leader. 
But I truly believe that in our world today and forever, always, there has to be boundaries. There has to be a sense of expectation. There has to be a sense of commitment, a sense of wanting to accomplish something. Not everybody, it's like it was said on one of the tweets or something about our baseball team. I think it was Dickerson that said this, Dickinson. You know, not everybody hated to lose. Some people just was okay to lose. Mm. You know, I think as coaches, we need to try to help develop a passion for hating to lose because there's a difference and loving to win and hating to lose. And I think it's our responsibility to help people understand that. And what that takes is a different route than just loving to win. I mean, I've coached a lot of players that just love to win mm. and like to have a good time and want to enjoy success. Mm. But when the meat meets the highway, it's a little harder, as you know, and it's a little more difficult and it's, so when you're challenged, how do you handle it? Not everybody mm. can handle it. So I think that God puts us in a position to try to help them handle that. Mm. Sometimes it's not always the right way we handle it, but I think that it's all meant from the heart. Mm. You know, I don't think there's no malice in it. I think every coach in the country does not try to lead with malice. I, mm. I really believe that. Every coach in the country wants the best for that individual and for their team. And that's mm. what I want. I want my players to understand that going halfway or just showing up when it's time for practice and being the first one out the door and the last one to start practice, it's not going to happen. Mm. We're not going to win a championship. I mean, we won five in a row down the stretch to win a share of that title. That's not easy. Mm. I mean, look at our baseball team, what they did down the stretch to win and to get hot. You know, we I have two new coaching staff members, Barbara Ferris that played at Tulane, that was an All-American there, played in the pros for 10 years, coached in the pros for six years. Jessica Barber that played at the University of Mobile, all-time assist leader. We had our first team practice a couple of days ago. Mm. And they both said, do y'all practice that hard all the time? Mm. And Jack and I, my other assistant, we looked at each other and said, yeah, and it wasn't really what we do. It was just kind of hard because we play no out of bounds. And they said, mm. we've never seen somebody play consistently that hard. Mm. I said, well, it's an expectation. So I believe in a coach's calling, you have to demand your best. God mm. expects us to be our best every day. I just did devotion this morning with my granddaughters that are staying with us. And it says that God doesn't expect us to be perfect. He doesn't. But we have to ask him for guidance and direction so we can strive to be our best. And I believe through coaching, that has to be our job to be able to try to instill in young women and the people around us to wake up and give our best every day. That's my mission every day is to be better than I was or give my very best that day. Mm. That, that, that's why I asked you that question, Coach. I mean, you, you, people know your story. People know everything. You, you All the people you've impacted through your career. I mean, it's just, if you if you look at your story, they, they, there's a higher calling going, I think. There's a plan with you, you know, and, uh, and what to go on. And, and the plan took you to Southern Miss in 04, and you have just had a heck of a run there. Uh, like I said, it impacted so many lives at Southern Miss. I mean, two-time coach of the year you, you, for Conference USA. Uh, you've done so much. And, uh, but, and, and coach, just kind of getting your story. You know, things are moving along and, the, you know, you're impacting lives. Things are, you know, positive. Just, get, just you know, people love Coach McNeilis on campus. That's for dang sure. But in 2017, Coach, you, you just get that news. Uh, diagnosed with lung cancer. And, uh, you know, when – when life's going along and, and you get news like that, Coach, I mean, what, what was that like back in 2017? You know, I was in denial, to be very honest with you. 
you know, when they, I thought I was having heart issues. So I kept telling our trainer because cancer doesn't run in my family, heart does. So I was having pain in my jaw and down my arm. It was radiating. And so it started like in November when I, when late November during Thanksgiving tournament. So I was eating aspirin. I mean, every time I'd have pain, I'd eat aspirin. And I even had some nitroglycerin that my parents had. And I would, when it would get really bad, I would just take their nitroglycerin. And so in January, my trainer said, I am not giving you any more aspirin. And I said, well, okay, I'll just get my own. I'll stick it in my pocket. Because in games, when my blood pressure would go up, that's when it would get really bad. And so we played at Western Kentucky and I kind of blacked out after yelling in a timeout. So I had had an issue with blood pressure spikes when I was at Memphis. And I said, that's what it is. It's just my blood pressure spike and I'm going to be fine. Well, after that happened, which I'd had an episode at Memphis and I said, I am going to be fine. So that was on a Saturday. Sunday, I stayed in bed all day. My husband says, you have to go to the doctor. I said, I am fine. As long as I can keep my blood thin, it's going to keep on going. I'm sure I got some blockage, but I will be fine. I can just keep my blood thin. I'll be okay. Well, my daughter's a nurse practitioner and she says, mom, this, it just doesn't work this way. So on that Monday, my players, when I walked in practice, were all sitting at half court and they said, we're not practicing today. And I said, what? Unless you go to the doctor, you're not practicing. And I said, well, we're practicing and I am fine. And they said, we're not practicing till you leave to go to the doctor. I said, let's get through practice today. I'm going to sit in this rolling chair and then I'll go to the doctor. They said, you promise. I said, I promise. So I went, we went through practice, had, went to urge care. I said, it's no big deal. So they did an x-ray of my lungs, my, all that, did EKG. And the doctor actually is a friend of ours. He was, was one of our family doctors in Memphis. And he had moved down here to take care of his mother. And he said, Joy, you got a blood clot on your lungs. So I drove over to the hospital and they said, we need to do a CT scan of your lungs. I said, okay. So we did it. And that's when they found that it was a mass and not a blood clot. And so, you know, then they had to biopsy and go through all that stuff. And so when they told me that I had lung cancer, you know, I'm like, okay, it's not a big deal. Just go in and get it. So we ended up, we went to the WNIT that year. And so it was a little bit longer. We got beat in the first round. And I do think that was a God thing because I was able to have the surgery earlier. And uh, so we had the surgery. They thought they got it all. And so I was like, you know, it's not a big deal. I went back to work in three weeks and I'm like, I'm fine. It's not, you know, and I just kind of said, I'm okay. The doctor said, you cannot go back to work. I said, I am fine. Why are we making a big deal out of this? And so then when it came back in 2020, that's when it really hit me. Mm -hmm. And so I still do take a pill because it's still there. But, you know, I'm a believer in, and I was weak and I get tired, but I'm really much more adjusted to it now. I'm just a believer in that as long as God gives me strength every day, I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to press on and we're going to roll. <laughs> when I get weak and I can't go on, then, you know, that's a different story. But as long as I have the ability and God gives me the strength, we're going to rock and roll. Because you're, you're fired up and you're the, you got to leave. That's what I'm fired up. Let's go. So, and, and, and no, it, and that's what's so impressive about this 22 23 season, coach. Everybody knows what you're dealing with, but what do you do? I'm going to lead this team to their first regular season conference championship in about 30 years. And uh, how has that run for you this year? I mean, with the team just playing inspired, fired up. <laughs> you know, we, we really did play very hard. We play really good at times. You know, and we had two games we felt like we should have won, that we didn't win. And I really believe it was because of travel in the Sun Belt. You know, we all talked about being in the Sun Belt, it's going to be better travel. Well, it is to Louisiana Lafayette. It is to Troy. It is to Louisiana Monroe. But it's not to App State. It's not because most of the Sunbelt schools are in rural areas. Well, guess what? You can't get there. You can't get there. So we played at App. 
drove through the night in the mountains to Marshall. It made everyone sick. We took Dramamine through the mountains. It was awful. And the reason I did it at night was because I thought we would sleep. Because fellow coaches said, don't do it during the day because your kids are not going to be able to practice the next day to be able to play a two o'clock game on Saturday at Marshall. You're not. So drive through the night. It's a six hour drive so that they'll be able to sleep it off. Well, the coach from app said, you look like your team was on drama main playing Marshall. And, you know, we have a chance to win it at the buzzer, but I think that travel whacked us. It really did. Um, teams that chartered that trap, that trip won. So I do believe in this league, there are some flights you may have to charter one leg to be able to give your team an opportunity. It, 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 but coach, when we watch this team, it is so fun to watch them play, how inspired they play for you, the way they talk about you. Uh, it, one of the players in particular, Dominique Davis, I mean, she's a talent. How is that coaching her? You know, Dom and I have a great relationship. She's in our offices all the time. Dom loves to be challenged, but she don't like it all the time. You know, she and I butt heads. We do. Uh, she gets punished. Her, her first year with us, she was punished a lot. She lived in a 15-pound weighted vest almost every day, snake in the Coliseum. She had to learn that there's a way that you're going to play for us, and there's a way you're not going to play for us. And so, you know, she's just a unique individual that we've really had to push. And the fortunate thing, her parents are all supportive. They're supportive. Coach, you got to do what you got to do. And, you know, last year she played with a ruptured disc in her back down the stretch, did not practice a lot, um, and gave us all she had when she was able to go in the game, was able to play for us. Mm -hmm. But she is definitely a unique individual. She will be back. She's had her surgery. She's back running, cutting, and all that. So we're hoping, you know, by the 1st of July, she'll be able to make some contact. So she is. She's a special player. And uh, looking for great things for her this year. Oh, that's awesome. Just the program you put together, you know, what you're dealing with being a cancer survivor and, and what have you. I mean, you know, the wristband thing, McNeil is strong, you know, you're, you're tough as nails is a whole theme. And uh, But how, how's, how's that been? And you got your 300th win plus this year as well. I mean, just this whole run with the community kind of, uh, you're, you're a hero. You're a hero. I don't know about all that. Ah, you're, you're a hero, coach. <laughs> You know, I'm just, I'm just a person. I want to say a young person, but I'm not. Uh, you know, I just, I'm living a dream. You know, that's, God's just blessed me. He's been very good to me. He blessed me growing up in a Christian home with parents that were very motivational. And you know, when you grow old, you see things that you do like your parents. Like as a kid, my dad listened to sermons all the time. Then he listened to Zig Ziglar. And he listened to motivational speakers all the time. And I remember that as a kid. What do I do? Listen to podcasts. I listen to sermons where I can get motivational things that I pull for my team and that I use when I speak. And so it's all interesting when you see things turn that table. And so, you know, I'm just who I am and getting that opportunity to be a mom, to be a grandmother, a yaya -ya to my grandkids, you know, to be the wife to an awesome husband that gave up his own career so that I could live my dream. And I'm getting to do it at Southern Miss. I mean, there's no better place than to me than living in Hattiesburg and being at a place where I have stories galore to tell recruits of how important and how the spe people are special here because people here give of themselves so Southern Miss students, not just athletes, so Southern Miss students can live dreams. I have a group of women, they're called Soaring Higher. It's a group of women we put together as mentors to our players. They had their second meeting last night. They are working to impact our players in building our players' own brand so they can work not just in the world of athletics, 
So they prepare themselves of life after basketball. Mm -hmm. And this, this group of women, buddy, they're fired up. They're excited. It's resume writing, building a brand, headshots. I mean, they're doing all interviews. They're doing all kinds of things with our players. And to me, that's my vision. I don't want my players to graduate from Southern Miss and not know what they're going to do with their life. And I've had that. And it is heartbreaking when, and we've all been there. Like, what are you going to do? I mean, there's, everybody goes through that. And I had this a couple of years ago and I had a mentor program. I was made resolve that I could not have it anymore because all the strict rules with the NCAA. And so now I'm able to restart that. And that group of women, a lot of them are a group of women that's just empty nesters and they don't know what to do with their life. And so I'm telling you, they are rocking and rolling, trying to work to help these young girls on our team be better beyond basketball. And I just think that's exciting. So they came up with the name Soar Higher. That's what they named their group, Soar Higher. So I'm excited about that. But I also want to say too, with my cancer and tying that in with basketball, I have a heart for the people in our community that cannot get to their cancer treatments. So there are, whether we realize it or not, there are people in our community that are retired, that are elderly people that have moved here. Some have lived here all their lives and they don't have children here. They don't have a way to get to their cancer treatments. So I'm a part of a navigation fund to raise money that goes to the Forest General Foundation. It is tax deductible. And all you've got to do is make a check out to the Forest General Foundation but the navigation fund on where it says FAR, Coach McNellis, and it goes to helping our elderly or people that do not have a way to get to their cancer treatments, to uh, get their treatments. So if anyone can help me out there, Martha Vardaman Dearman is the one that is handling that for me at the foundation at Forest General. And so I'm just really excited to be a part of that because I was unaware of how many people in our community could not get to treatments. And it's really, really sad. So what, what a special message right there. And then the power of Forest General Hospital with the power of Southern Miss combined. I mean, what a, what a change it can make in so many lives right there. So thanks for sharing that. And I'll be sure to promote that as much as I can. You can count on that, Thank Coach. You. Um, and, and one thing with cancer awareness, you know, things like that, the, the KYAL Cancer Fund, you know, oh, legendary... Awesome. NC State basketball coach, you know, wound up passing away from cancer, but just the impact she made and her legacy and the color pink, what it means. This year's women's basketball final four, I mean, uh, you, you were there and, and you know, all the, the, the cancer survivors were recognized and pink was just all in the audience. And how powerful of a moment was that for you? You know, it was really powerful. Uh, when Coach Yao started her foundation, it was for breast cancer only. And now she it has expanded to all cancers. And so, like, next year, I want to play a K Yao game. We've never done that here at Southern Miss. What we have done in the past, I want to make our lung cancer game that we have in November to keep all the money local is what I've always done. But our pink game, because I've learned more about the KYAL game, because I went to a couple of meetings while I was at the Final Four, they're wanting to use some money we raise here to add for lung cancer research and help with some grants to give to Hattiesburg to be able to do research just for our people. And so I want to take the game that we have in February and really expand that so there can be specific things done for our Hattiesburg community. But she was amazing, legendary coach. We actually played them in the first round of the NCAA tournament. So I wasn't able to get all the seats taken. They couldn't get in there. We played Coach Yao and them uh, in the first round of the NCAA tournament when I was at Memphis. But what a great lady and a lady, lady with such a giving heart. She was amazing. Coach, I want to, I want to talk a little bit something um... – you know, women's athletics, it's grown so much through the years, so much more recognition, what have you. And Title IX was a big part of that. 
Uh, Title IX and, and what it meant to you and where it's at and where things are going. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on it? You know, Title IX, when it was initially, I was still a player then. And so that's when the NCAA came about. That's when full scholarships for women came on. You know, that's when Coach James first got here. A lot of things began to happen for women's basketball, for women's athletics in general. Back then, women's basketball was the premier sport. Um, they didn't have a lot of other sports. But in at the world of athletics, athletic departments had to open opportunities for women in other sports. And that happened. It's come a long ways. Um, you know, the exposure for women, the opportunities for women. Uh, then it took a, even a greater step in giving women the same opportunities as men. Uh, they've taken even greater steps when you're dealing with the things the women get, you know, like cost of attendance for players, you know, travel for players, making it comparable to the men. Salaries for some coaches being similar to the men. So there's been a lot of step TV coverage. You know, that's another big step. You know, it doesn't happen everywhere that it's the same. It's not the same at Southern Miss, but, you know, it is what it is. But the steps that have been made, you know, I'm all for it. Let's go. You can't jump on it and do things if you don't have resources. So I think as women's coaches that if you don't have it yet, then you know what? I believe, like I talked to a, a male coach that was complaining about it this year that's in our league. I said, but what are you doing? You know what? You got to help the process. You know, so I believe that falls back on me and my staff and my players. We got to do our part. So we have a golf tournament on September the 8th that we're going to fundraise. We redid our own locker room. We raised a hundred grand and redid our own locker room. So what the university can't help us do, I'm not going to sit around and complain about it. I'm okay with it. And, and you're a heck of a recruiter. We talked about, you know, for example, Janice Felder's recruitment and what have you. But recruiting's changed a little bit now. The NIL transfer report. Um, how is that coaching now with, with those two avenues now for players and with the NIL transfer portal kind of ties? You know, it really has changed the whole landscape of recruiting. Um, there's some good and some bad. I do believe that freshmen cannot, should not be able to transfer. I pers that's my personal opinion. I think because it's taken away teaching them how to handle adversity. You know, because it's going to be hard that first year. Everything's hard the first year. So, you know, just get tough. Get over it. I wanted to quit my freshman year. We ran 100 sprints. I went to my dorm, Hillcrest. Punched in my calling card and I called my dad and I said, dad, college basketball is not for me. He said, I'm sorry, sis. Remember beating that grass out on that dirt court. You're not coming home. You stay in there. What would I have done if my dad would have come got me? <laughs> I called Coach James and said, my baby don't like it there. You know, you get all that stuff now. Parent calls. I'm like, geez, come on, toughen up. It's going to be okay. What an incredible vibe right there you just said. Because, I mean, but you, you've just impacted so many lives. What if you would have left Southern Miss? Your, your story is different, way different. It would, you know, like you, for example, you stayed, you fought, you clawed. Yeah. Look at you now. You know, if, if a young athlete's here, listen to this, just fight the fight, claw, yeah. scratch. Get after it. <laughs> have some, have some grit. Have some guts. I call it guts. Just have some guts. That's all I love, you gotta have. I love that, Coach. You it, know, it, so I do think it has changed. You know, the transfer portal changes things. You know, your some programs don't sign any high school players. We will all sign a couple of high school players. We will, um, but I will take some players out of the transfer portal. My personal feeling out of the transfer portal is I have learned through this process, I really ought to want to take transfer portal players that I have a relationship with. I really do. Whether I've recruited, recruited them previously or I know their coach or I know something about their club coach because I, I want to know who I'm getting. That's my opinion. 
um, I think you just have to be careful. They're in the transfer portal usually for a reason. And, um, you know, I just think you have to be careful there. But I will always take um, high school players, a couple at least. I think they have to build the foundation of the program because they're the ones that takes ownership in the program. You know, transfer portal players, I don't know that they're going to take ownership unless they're going to be here a while. You know, they're going to get in, get what they got to get done. The other thing is the NIL. You know, it's a game changer. You know, we lost a player this year that could have been a game changer to us over six grand. You know, she gets six grand to go somewhere else. We're just kind of getting hours rolling. Mm -hmm. Women's basketball don't have any this well at this point. So, you know, it is where it is. We had a couple of players last year that had NIL deals. Uh, there's some in the works. But to the top collectives just starting. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. And we will continue to lose players to the NIL. We will, because unless things change here for us and making contributions, and hopefully that will change. Yeah, and, and you hit on a good one right there. I mean, I'm trying to make more awareness. I'm glad you said that. The to the top collective for Southern Miss people. The, the NIL has changed the landscape for college sports. It has totally. Southern Miss is getting things in gear with that. If you have the means, if you have the ways to, to support to the top collective for the talent here at Southern Miss, you know, and it's it just that's the landscape of college sports. So to the top collective, thanks for bringing it up, Coach. I can't stress enough how important that is. <laughs> so, uh, Coach, just, just a little bit. You hit on it, too, really well right there. But maybe some more advice for parents with a young female athlete on, on just, you know, trying to grow their, their, their game and trying to get things going at a young age? You know, I think number one is help them understand that it's not a once a week thing. It's not twice a week. It is a daily grind to be great. And it's something you have to work on. And today's athlete, usually has learned to work with someone. And so they only, when they come to college, they only want to work with practice. They don't learn to work on their own. You must somehow need to help your daughter understand they have to work on their own. They've got to go get up shots on their own. So they don't need mom or dad always to rebound for them. They've got to learn that, that you've got to work on your own. You've got to be able to help grow your own game. You know, they need to do that. There are some high school coaches that don't have practice in the summer. There are a lot of high school coaches that do. Make sure they're there. Make sure they're early. Make sure they're on time. You know, make sure they stay late. Encourage them to live their dream, but don't drive them to that dream. Because I have coached players, they play because of their parents. Don't do that. If they don't want to do it, let them do something else. And I, a court, based on the age, sometimes you do have to drive them to be able to help them understand what they have. And then if they catch on fire, then you've done your job. But encourage them to dream big and dream a dream. But encourage them to work, to live that dream. Get in camps. Get in camps of schools that have the talent, that, that, that are their talent level. You know, like we had some campers here for our elite camp, and we cut our elite camp off. They went to LSU and they had 500 in their elite camp. Mm. So that's great. That's a great money maker. But those players, Kim took their money and that's great. But they're never playing at LSU. Kim probably don't even remember their name. <laughs> but if you come to us, you go to Southeastern Louisiana, you go to Tulane, you know, you go to Mississippi College, you go to UAB, we're going to remember you. Yes, they won the national championship. But you need to be in camps where your daughter can be exposed. Like I said, we offered two players out of a league camp we had never seen. Yeah, and, that's cool. and, and the culture here is just different in a lot of places. It's fun. They know your name. Uh, you, you got coaches leading you like Coach McNillis. I mean, what else do you want? It, it's a great, you know, I speak personally, played football here in the 90s. It's 
25 years ago. It's high five and chest bumps. Well, it, it's just, it's different here. Much different. Yes. You know, and we're family. We're mm -hmm. family within our program, but we're family within the university and within the Hattiesburg community. And when you talk about family, when you talk about playing hard, when you talk about love, there's four things I talk about in our program. Accept people that are different from you. Respect all people. Give of yourself for others to be successful and you'll end up loving people. And that's the four pillars of our program. Accept, respect, give, and love. Oh, Coach, what a great message. And if anybody's listening to that, take that to heart. It was an honor, and I hope to see you really soon in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We can definitely catch up and, and high five and, uh, and cheer whoever we're watching on at that point. Well, it's an honor. When you reached out to me, I was like, oh, me? <laughs> you have all these great people on, and I'm just Joyly McDellis. And I'm oh, like, sure. wow. You, you are great, and people got excited when I said I have you on. I can't wait to, to launch this show. Well, Coach. For me and you, to all these Southern Miss fans, I think it'd be good if we give them all a good Southern Miss. Southern Miss to the top. To the top, yeah. I tell you what, Joy Lee McNellis is one of my favorite people in the entire Southern Miss world, and I had a blast catching up with her right there. Well, that's it for another edition of Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, we're still on that uh, push for 1,000-plus subscribers. So once again, going to ask you something. That's free and easy to do if you haven't done it already, and that's to head to our YouTube page, Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime, and press that subscribe button and get right back to your day. Well, until next time, as always, it's Southern Miss to the top.